Realty Show. I'm John Schink. You know, it's like there's not a day that goes by anymore that NAR isn't being sued by someone, even though they settled their lawsuit. It's weird how that happens. And I think what we'll find is there's just going to continue to be uh, lawsuit after lawsuit because, well, they're an easy target. They've been, they've been found guilty of one thing, and so people will just keep hitting them until they um, die, maybe. So uh, I wanted to go over this uh, lawsuit with you. This is a little bit different uh, in this case because you're getting um, they own a property that uh, they that is maintained to be not not very nice. Um, so I thought the best thing to do is to get in the lawsuit and uh, you know just go over it. So here we go. This has been filed in the um, in Los Angeles, um, and I'm just going to do this here so I can read it. And then so. Uh, basically what it is is the National Association of Realtors has a has realtor.com they own the domain realtor.com but they sold it to um, move.com which is owned by owned by Fox yes they sold it it, it was owned by someone else before I don't remember who it was but uh, let's just get into it. Uh, this will explain it pretty well. There's eight real estate agents suing Move.com and the National Association of Realtors. So here it says, and this is how it's set up. It says Move is a real estate listing company. The company operates so-called Move Network of real estate websites, the largest of which is Realtor.com. Move Inc. owns the listing syndication and reporting platform List Hub. The company also operates Avail. Following its acquisition in 2020, doorsteps.com, following its acquisition in 2013, and as well as moving.com, re relocation.com, and upnest, following its acquisition in 2022. Move Inc. utilizes each of these brands' web properties and the data derived from interactions therewith by real estate agents and consumers in connection with its so called lead generation business, which is the subject of this action. So, what is Move? Inc., what is their job? Well, they sell leads to real estate agents, right? So say I want to be a real estate agent. Oh, I am. And say I want, my business is kind of slow. I need to spend money on leads. And what is a lead if you're not familiar with that? That's like a, a basically anybody with a pulse, okay? And what you want to do is you want to get in front of that person when they want to buy or sell a house and you want to market your services. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing wrong with that at all. However, just as a real estate agent who's been around the block many, many times, you have to understand that everything in real estate is somehow fraudulent. There's always an element of fraud in everything. Um, you know, you sell courses to uh, learn how to flip houses. You, uh, you know, you sell leads to people who can't, can't, you, who can't close on the leads and then blame them for it. Uh, if you want to be a real estate broker and you want real estate agents, you promise them um, a, a bunch of leads that they can work because they're probably not good at developing leads on their own. This is all part of the game. And after you've been in it for a while, um, it disgusts you. But it also makes you very, very skeptical of anything and anyone. So maybe that's a good thing. So um, in this case, uh, these different websites, what ends up usually happening is you go to a website, you see a property, you type a little button that says, hey, I'd be interested in, in this property and learning more about this property. And pretty soon you'll get 17 people calling you 17 agents calling you, wanting to knock down your door uh, to sell you, uh, you know, to, to help you list a house or to help you buy a house. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I don't, I, I personally don't buy any leads. And um, it is what it is. So anyway, it says, this is the part that it ties in with the National Association of Realtors. So that's why I thought we should go over. It says, Move.Inc. also has a longstanding partnership with Defendant National Association of Realtors, the real estate industry's largest trade association, which we're going to argue that point in a minute, uh, for operating Realtor.com and the National Association of Real Estate Realtors web properties. As a result, Move Inc. has positioned itself as the voice of the National Association of Realtors and all real estate agents associated therewith. I would disagree with that based on the situation. Uh, Move Inc. relies upon and takes advantage of this positioning in perpetrating or ratifying the unlawful conduct alleged here, and such positioning is a key factor which allows Move.Inc. Uh, move comma Inc. to successfully engage in the unlawful conduct alleged herein because plaintiffs and each member of the prospective class of plaintiffs relies upon Move Inc. to faithfully, honestly, and responsibly advocate for the nation's real estate agents and maintain 
each of their professional best interests in the real estate industry. Move Inc. has made Maurer complicit in the allegations contained herein. Also, Move Inc. and the other defendants have utilized its association with NAR to facilitate the unlawful conduct alleged herein. And let me tell you how this works as an agent. Okay, I'm an agent. I'm, I belong to NAR. I'm forced to join NAR to be a part of the MLS. Okay? And as we looked at that last um, lawsuit last week, that might be changing. But, but it's not now. To be a part of the MLS, you have to be a part of NAR. Okay, and so then NAR positions itself as, uh, as the, voice of, uh, 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 the voice of all real estate agents associated with, here with. So now they're saying NAR is our trade group, right? NAR is only looking out for its agents. That's false. That's 100% false, and that's the problem that I have with uh, the National Association of Realtors. It says on their website, it's working for America's property owners, the National Association provides a facility for professional development, research and exchange of information among its members, and to the public and government for the purpose of preserving the free enterprise system and the right to own real property. The right to own real property is not advocating for real estate agents in the United States. The two are not the same, and it drives me nuts, okay? It drives me nuts. It says, what, the National Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate, is America's largest trade association, representing 1.5 million members, including NARS institutes, societies, and councils involved in all aspects of real estate and commercial industries, and in residential and commercial real estate industries. But it's, it's the voice for real estate and the largest trade association, and they don't put realtors number one. They put this ridiculous right to own real property in front of it, and it makes no sense. This is just me, okay? Many other people might have different opinions, and that's fine. I just, I just, people think that, oh, NAR is looking out for the agents. No, you have to be a part of NAR to use the MLS, okay? NAR doesn't look out for its agents. They like to sell education property, the education. They love to sell that. They love to tell you what you have to do uh, with the, with the set, like, if you just look at the NAR agreement that they settled, uh, I wasn't a part. Nobody asked me what I wanted. They, they certainly settled without my, my, uh, my input, and they just do this stuff constantly. So what happens is, in this particular case, is agents believe in NAR, okay? Move.com is, is not owned by NAR. NAR sold the domain to move, dot, dot move, move Inc. okay? But Realtor.com is the property, okay? And what happens is, is agents, young agents especially, think that because it's tied in with the National Association of Realtors, it must be safe and it must be a great product. That's where it is. And so what they're saying in this lawsuit is they're saying, you're using the shield of NAR, the National Association of Realtors, to conduct business that is otherwise unseemly at best, paying for leads, which as an agent you learn never to do if you're on your own, if you're part of a large team, the team, the only reason why you're a part of the team is because you're paying, they're paying you, you know, paying for leads. So let's get into it. It says, that, and this is where the argument starts, is NAR is the largest trade association in the United States and is purportedly operated for the benefit of those who work in the real estate industry. That's, see how it even says purport, they even in the lawsuit question whether or not NAR works for real estate agents because it's, it's bizarre. Uh, they, again, property, property rights. They don't ever say they work for real estate agents, so it's kind of odd. Um, and it says, it, and it purportedly functions as a self-regulatory organization for real estate brokerage. For decades, NAR has held itself as America's largest trade association, representing 1.5 million members. Now, we have to pay dues to NAR, okay? We're required to be a part of NAR to have the MLS. I don't know if you can understand, like every real estate agent is essentially part of NAR, because we have to be. Can't be real estate without, agent without it, at least in the residential space. Now, there's eight plaintiffs. I'm just gonna go through like one of what happens and just go through it. It says, uh, defendants advertise, market, promote itself as a so-called lead generation line of products and service to real estate agents throughout the United States. Defendants employ a large, aggressive sales force with cold calls, contacts, and solic solicit business from real estate agents. In doing, 
Defendants provide sales personnel with scripts to use in soliciting real estate agents and brokers. These scripts contain a number of false and misleading statements, and these sales personnel are otherwise instructed to provide false and misleading information. That's what the lawsuit says. Now, what this is saying, and just to break it down for you as an agent, I get calls all day long from people trying to sell me stuff, mostly health insurance, mostly health insurance. But it used to be as a younger agent, uh, Zillow would call, um, Realtor.com would call, and they'd say, hey, man, why don't you buy some leads? And then they promise all these things. You're going to get 60 leads a month, okay, in your zip code, and they're going to be exclusive to you, okay? And it's all lies, all lies, because they have no idea how many leads are going to come in. They have none. But so what ends up happening is these agents end up saying, oh, you know, all right, this sounds great to help my business. And then what ends up happening is, is they end up calling dead people, people that don't exist, um, obvious false leads. They go to the company that's providing leads and say, these are fake. You said you would reimburse me for the fake ones. The company says, no, no, we're not going to reimburse you for Jack. You're just an idiot. And this is what happens. It doesn't take a lawsuit for me to know how this is going because this is how it goes. And if you've been in real estate long enough, you, you see this happen time and time again. So anyway, it says, oh, and by the way, all those leads that come from all these different places get mixed up into one place. It's really great. There used to be a place called, I think it was Tiger Leads that Realtor.com owned. I don't, I don't know where they went or not Realtor.com, but Move Inc. owned. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, anyway. Um, it says, defendants lawfully and in compliance with applicable privacy laws obtain large volumes of consumers who are currently interested in purchasing residential real estate properties and also were in need of local real estate agent. Defendants, defendants continuously vetted, updated, verified, and maintained the foregoing data and personally identifying information for each such person so that any information provided to plaintiff would be current, accurate, and maintaining the characteristics of a lead as stated here and below. The defendants organized and sorted such data and interested individuals by zip code. Defendants grouped the foregoing data, individuals, and information into small groups, a minimum of 36 to 40 vetted persons, which qualified as a lead as characterized here, and sold the contact information for such persons to real estate agents who subscribe to defendants' various lead generation projects, which are distributed on a highly limited basis. And so there's another part of it. Like you can pay for the base plan and then the enhanced plan. And if you're like part of Zillow.com now, instead of paying like a fixed amount of, for a p fixed amount of leads per month, now you're paying for things like uh, if you actually take a transaction to closing, you get to write a big chunk of your check to the, uh, the company, which is just great. It says, um, when defendants grouped the foregoing data and sold it to plaintiffs, each purchasing plaintiff would be the only real estate agent to receive that particular grouping of data or that group of data, which would, would be shared with one other real estate agent. However, such grouping of data would not be widely disseminated. So they're saying we're giving you exclusive leads. And just as a warning, I'm probably going to go long tonight, but you know what? We should just go through these things. And, I'm, and if you don't like it, it's okay. Not many people watch my videos as it is. By the way, if you do watch my video, please subscribe. I'd really like to get to 1,000 uh, subscribers at some point here. But anyway, let's continue. It says, which each such person would be a lead for which each plaintiff would pay a set price for a minimum of 36 to 40 such leads per month. Defendant's lead generation business is based upon legitimate and verified leads and therefore provided each plaintiff with a premium and exclusive opportunity to obtain clients. The information obtained by defendants was voluntary and lawfully acquired from such persons who are currently and legitimately desirous of the services of a real estate agent. Defendants' leads are exclusive and will not be shared with other real estate agents or brokers, and such leads are limited in distribution to one other real estate agent or broker. Distribute, d defendants will distribute such leads on a priority or exclusive basis to real estate agents or brokers who pay higher fees or subscription rates. Plaintiffs would be refunded or credited for the leads which turned out to be incorrect, inaccurate, and or which otherwise did not meet the foregoing attributes for what is described herein as a lead. So this is what they're saying, like, look, these are the things that you promised. These are the, the defendants, are, they paid attention, and then you, you, you were a jerk. Defendants undertook ongoing efforts to maximize, maximize the legitimacy of, legitimacy of such leads and minimize any duplication of selling the same lead to multiple real estate agents. Subscribing real estate agents, including each plaintiff and each member of the a prospective class, will receive a minimum number of leads per month and any shortage will be refunded or properly credited to each plaintiff's account. So what they're saying is, you're selling me that if this lead is not a real person, as long as I mark it down and send it back to you, you will credit me 
for this, for this non-lead. I don't think I'd have any problem with that. I don't think I'd have any problem with that, but they don't do that. And I know they don't do that. Other similar communications and des designations, I say as a group, you know, there's 17 million websites that provide leads to agents. Uh, and by the way, I did use one service one time in property management we paid for. I don't do property management anymore, but that's how it went. Look, if we called the person and they weren't real or something, automatically thrown out, money returned, no big deal. Um, subscribing real estate agents, oh, I'm sorry. Other similar communications and designations would suggest the reliability exclusively and accuracy of the value of each such lead. In addition, defendants failed to disclose to plaintiffs that they utilize other owned, controlled, operated land affiliate, oh, and affiliate websites. My highlighter's broken, so it looks stupid. Web properties, media, um, and social media, and technologies related to collectively by the affiliates to obtain, collect, harvest, scrape, analyze, store, access, organize, and manipulate the personal information and, uh, of, and identify personal potential leads who are both legitimately interested in buying residential properties and many of those who have no such interest in the foregoing. These processes, the unlawful bundling, are designed to amass a tremendous and tremendously growing database, which the defendants then characterize as leads. The unlawful bundling is facilitated by the operation of such numerous websites and brand, which are designed to attract even tangentially anyone who interacts with keywords such as home, property, real estate, house, mortgage, rent, and intentionally includes prospective purchasers of of vehicles, unrelated products and services, non-existent consumers, duplicative consumers, and other persons with no interest whatsoever in purchasing real estate properties. Defendants engaged in the unlawful bundling of all these persons and presented each of them to plaintiffs and each, num each member of the prospective class as a vetted and verified collection of legitimate leads, uh, i.e. a consumer who is seeking the services of real estate agents. So what's going on is, let's say some four-year-old kid is on Facebook I don't know why, but they're on Facebook and they see an, uh, an ad, so they click it, okay? And then that four-year-old is on the website, on a website that they went to, and they click that. And all this time, like the kid's getting information um, on in a database, and and uh, and, and and quickly, that information is trans transferred to a real estate agent who thinks, oh, here's somebody that wants to buy a house who needs my services. They go ahead and call that person, and it's like the person's mother or father, and they're like, we never said any of this, we're not interested in any of your projects, go do something to yourself that's uh, anatomically improper, to be nice. And this happens all day long, you're sitting there calling leads that aren't real, and so just as a relief from that, you write down, hey, this wasn't a, a real lead, right? And then so you send it back in and say, I'd like a credit for this, and what they're alleging is, that didn't happen that they weren't credited back for the stuff that they sold and they knew that the stuff they sold was garbage. That's the allegation in this, in this lawsuit. It's not my allegation. I have, I have no opinion on that. I'm just one of those people who doesn't buy leads for my real estate business. And they're also saying like, look, if you're searching for a mortgage, okay, that's, that, that's, not, really a real estate, that's not really somebody that you need a real estate agent for, you need a, a, a mortgage person for. Why are you giving me that lead? It doesn't help me at all. It says, notwithstanding the foregoing, at all relevant times, defendants were and remain keenly aware that approximately half of these so-called leads that defendants bundled and sold to plaintiffs were not leads at all, but a series of individuals for whom defendants had collectively collected personally identifying information, but who have no interest in purchasing real estate. In fact, in many cases, defendants knew they could not verify that personal, personally identifying information sold to plaintiffs is even legitimate or truly associated with an actual living human being. So. You're, you're giving me information that's not real, okay, and I'm paying for it, and you promised me that you vetted these people, so what the hell? Uh, defendants failed and refused to take, d despite knowledge of the foregoing, defendants failed and refused to take any action to vet, legitimize, or confirm the identity of those so-called leads and deliberately sold fake and false leads along with other leads which range from highly questionable to illegitimate. Now there are some companies that will employ an, a middleman, and so what happens is you get a lead, okay, the middle person, middleman calls the lead and says, are you a real human? And if they say yes, then they pass that lead on to you. That would be vetted. What they're arguing is nobody vetted anything, and you used a bunch of different websites and a bunch of different pieces of information to try and create a person that was maybe not even real. Um, Defendants engaged in this behavior specifically to defraud, deceive, and take advantage of each of the plaintiffs 
and uh, by falsely increasing the size and scale of the defendant's offerings of the products and services. Look, you're a struggling real estate agent. You don't know if you can go on much longer. You have no money. You're spending your last dime on trying to get real estate leads. You're, you're trying to spend the money on leads to try and get one more person through your door so that you can actually continue in the business. You're desperate. This is, this is a solution to you being desperate. You're going to have leads, and they're going to be vetted, and they really want to talk to you, and they're really, really interested in, in, in your business, which is fake. It's fake. It preys upon people who are desperate. And there are many, many, many desperate real estate agents in the United States, okay? Most places, there are thousands of more real estate agents than anyone could ever need. And it's just, it's a fact. Uh, dist defendants distributing of misleading information and unlawful bundling of personally identified information and consumer data were designed to create an exaggerated, padded, and fraudulent database of so-called leads which would be sold to unsuspecting real estate agents, including each of the plaintiffs and each member of the class that the plaintiffs seek to represent in this action. Defendants would then proceed to package and sell these databases to plaintiffs and those similarly situated as leads, knowing that approximately 50%, they knew ahead of time, that 50% of the leads that you would get were not going to be legit. For more, 50% or more such leads were not legitimate. Potential real estate transactors, defendants would further characterize these so-called leads as exclusive, shared only with one other agent, premium, or otherwise note that each plaintiff and other purchaser was obtaining a high-quality access to a high-quality group of leads. Defendants further misled, defrauded, and intentionally deceived each of the plaintiffs and each potential member of the class by representing that pay, by paying a subscription fee, enhanced the subscri subscription fees and other payments, each such real estate agent was obtaining specific benefits which had a high likelihood to generate business and clients for each real estate agent. You sold me a dream. You sold me the dream and then it wasn't true. This is basically America. Notwithstanding the foregoing, defendants and each of them knew and designed this scheme with the knowledge that approximately half such leads, unbeknownst to users of defendants' products and services, were not intended or designed to result in any legitimate potential business for each plaintiff and other real estate agents who purchased said leads. Each of the defendants is well aware of the scheme and the untruthful conduct which characterizes said scheme. Furthermore, each defendant conspired, collaborated, and designed the scheme to be concealed from plaintiffs and other real estate agents for the purpose of defrauding said plaintiffs and real estate agents. They knew about it. <laughs> they didn't do anything about it. Defendants were not satisfied. Defendants proceeded to develop this scheme, uh, develop this scheme in an effort to further defraud and cause harm to the plaintiffs and other real estate agents who purchased the defendants' products and services. More specifically, defendants calculated that defendants could earn significant revenue from these fake leads by engaging in the following practices. So now they know the, the, the argument is they knew the leads are not legitimate, okay? Rather than say, hey, man, we need to look at ourselves internally and we need to stop working, working for profit only. We need, we need to do the right thing. We need to be ethical. They didn't do that. They said, how can we monetize this fake leads even more? And these are the these are the uh, these are the processes that they did. Number one, massively distributing the misleading information and utilizing defendants' association with NAR to fraudulently induce trust and reliance in such misleading information. So, as I told you, if something is done by NAR, I automatically assume that it's legit. Okay. So, if I were buying leads, I would think, hey, this is me personally. If I were buying leads tomorrow and NAR was associated with Move Inc. Okay, Realtor.com. I would trust them way before I would trust Zillow. This is from an agent. This is what I think. I, I can't help it. If, if NAR's supposed to be looking out for private property rights, but they really are looking out for me, but I don't understand that because they're not, and that's a weird deal. I still should be able to trust NAR, in theory, over like Zillow, who definitely doesn't like me. Zillow started their own brokerage. I mean, that's how much they dislike agents. Um, so there's that. And then employing a sales team, which was trained, who were provided various scripts designed to dis disseminate the misleading information along with other false and fraudulent information, including by withhold withholding relevant truthful information in an effort to defraud, deceive, and mischaracterize the value of potential effectiveness of defendant's lead generation business. Let me tell you about those sales teams, okay? Those people are terrible. They will call you and be your best friend and say all these nice things and say like, hey, you want to be a part of this business and all this wonderful stuff. 
and they're no good either. And I've often wondered, both with the health insurance that I get peppered with and lead generation services, look, if you guys are so good at lead generation and selling insurance, wouldn't you be a great real estate agent? Why, why, would, you, why would you work for like a realtor.com? Why would you work for a health insurance agency when you could just sell real estate if you were good at sales? And that, that, that should be the question that every real estate agent asks when someone's trying to sell them something aggressively. So they're saying, hey, you use scripts that minimize information that would be, would be useful in making a decision. Uh, such sales teams were enticed with large commission for sales and punished severely for cancellations by plaintiffs. So now they're saying structurally your business uh, the sales business, if you're a, a sales agent working for one of these companies, you get a massive bonus if you have success. And if somebody leaves the program, it's on you. You get penalized. So that's causing an environment where it makes more sense to cheat and lie than it does to actually just sell the product, which is leads. Uh, such sales teams were trained to utilize specific language approved by corporate leadership in interacting with, in interacting with plaintiffs, which were designed to mislead and defraud plaintiffs. So they're saying the scripts themselves were bad, and now we're using intentional words to try and sell this product, which you know not to be true. Such sales teams and affiliated consumer customer service teams were trained on how to further deceive and defraud complaining plaintiffs in a manner designed to wear down such plaintiffs who complained about the fake leads and cause attrition of such complaints while refusing to properly fund credit or account to plaintiffs for the substantial number of fake leads roughly 40% of the total leads. They say, look, you knew about these fake leads and you've designed a program by which you're not responsive. You make, the, um, you make it hard for me to get my money back on fake leads. Uh, requiring plaintiffs and other real estate agents to sign up for the various lead generation products and services online without providing such plaintiffs and other real estate agents with contracts, terms and conditions, therefore, but then distributing contracts, terms, and conditions after plaintiffs and other real estate agents are already committed to the lead generation products and service. What they're saying there, what they're alleging there is, we agreed to something, but there was no contract for me to read or terms and conditions until after I'd already signed up. So I don't even know what's, what the terms and conditions are. And then they say, unilaterally changing the contracts, terms, and conditions, which plaintiffs and other real estate agents were purportedly obliged by at various times without notice, in an effort to utilize new and different provisions in an effort to preclude lawsuits relating to fake leads. So what they're saying is, is as we're going, I signed up in this particular terms and conditions, even after I signed up and you gave them to me after I actually signed up. But even then, you keep changing the terms and conditions without notice or without, without my agreement. And then you're using those new terms and agreements to keep me from getting my, getting, getting my money back for fake leads. It says, implementing an ineffective, arduous, frustrating, inconsistent, deceitful, non-responsive, and attrition-based customer service program, the attrition program, which was designed to wear down plaintiffs and other real estate agents so that most would not be able to pursue refunds of the significant pays to, paid to them to defendants and thereby allow defendants to retain revenue from sales of fake leads. So, so think about this. You're a poor real estate agent. You have, you have very little money. You can hardly afford to eat. Okay, and you've signed up for this service believing that this is the way out. Finally, I'm going to have some money. My family's going to love me again because I'm going to bring in money. My kids are going to be able to go to school and have new clothes. And you're, you're ripping me off. Like by 40% of the leads I get are not even legit. Okay, and they're not exclusive. All right, and now like I'm trying to get my money back so that I can afford like school lunch for my kid. Okay, but you're going to fight me every step of the way to the point where I'm just disillusioned, to the point where maybe I go out of business and I have no money or energy to fight you anymore just to get my money back. This is, this is sick, dirty, adult stuff that's being alleged here. Uh, offering plaintiffs worthless credits and identifying promised and contractual refunds for selling the fake leads, which so-called credits included additional fake leads, which would cause a repetitive cycle of plaintiffs and other real estate agents never getting the substance nor value of what was promised to them in the misleading information. And so what they're doing is saying, look, you're, you know what? You're right. Okay, that was a fake lead. We'll give you a credit. Okay. But the amount of credits would always be more than the amount, than the amount that they would pay. So what would happen is, is like, okay, 
half of those leads are fake. It's true. Now you've got a credit, okay? But you never got the money back. So you're still paying for this stuff and you're getting your credits, but you're never getting actual dollars back, which is, it, and then it just keeps going. It snowballs. Um, fraudulent accounting practices, which consistently mischaracterize the payments, credits, partial refunds, and or the value of legitimate leads versus the fake leads knowingly distributed by defendants. Selling the fake leads and even legitimate leads over and over to various plaintiffs and other real estate agents while representing that such leads were exclusive or otherwise being shared with only one or very other very small number of other real estate agents instead of being massively distributed in a duplicative fashion. So let's just say you believe that you signed up for a program for a zip code, and I'll just use mine, so 63123. And you say, I want to be the exclusive agent in 63123. You're going to pay a premium for that. But what you don't realize, according to this allega these allegations, is um, you're not the only one that gets the information. Even though you've paid for the exclusivity of it, 15 other people are getting the same information, and they're and likely calling that person before you get a chance to. I mean, if you go to the bathroom and somebody else gets the lead, they're calling that person before you even get out of the bathroom. I mean, that's how fast this works. I think back when I was really paying attention, I think the time to call back a lead was like within five minutes or else the lead would, the chance of success went down to like 20% is, is terrible. That's just what I used to pay attention to. I don't pay attention to it anymore. If somebody doesn't leave me a voicemail, I don't care. I, I don't even, I, I have no interest in trying to find who this person is that's calling me because most of the time it's somebody selling me insurance, health insurance in particular. Um, let's see. Um, other unlawful, fraudulent, untruthful, and draconian conduct to create attrition and refuse to honor the promises, obligation, duties, and legal requirements owed by the defense to each plaintiff and each member of the class. And at the core of this scheme was the defendant's business strategy to generate income from selling and reselling 40 to 50% fake leads included with the legitimate leads. Defendants built their business model in part on this principle and obtained financing, funding, and engaged in a number of acquisitions or equity-based transactions based on such principle and ill-gotten gains that resulted for this scheme. So what they're saying is, is you just bought people out and added to your properties based on selling fake data. That's the allegation. NAR, and at all times was, the National Association independently and intimately aware of the scheme and complicit therein through NAR's relationship and reliance upon the other defendants to build its membership ranks. So they're saying, because you forced me to be a part of NAR, okay, you knew about this, okay, I believed you, and now it turns out, like, you, you did this. You're a part of this suit. NAR allows and contributes to its affiliation with its co-defendants to act as a broad endorsement of the conduct alleged herein and the co-defendants' fraudulent scheme itself so that the plaintiffs and each member of the prospective class trusted and relied upon NAR's affiliation with the other defendants and based at least in part on that relationship chose to do business with other defendants. NAR actively and passively induced each of the plaintiffs and each member of the prospective class to do business with the defense. So class action suit out of California, It'll be interesting to see if NAR can get out of it. I don't know. I don't know. So they talk about they talk about each uh, each client like what happened. I just want to go over one because I want you to see how the scheme works. It says plaintiff Maria Hardy received the misleading information from defendants through the marketing efforts of the defendants. Such marketing efforts included disseminating the mis misleading information to Hardy. Plaintiff Hardy reasonably relied on the misleading information and contacted defendant's sales personnel by telephone in or about February of 2022. During multiple telephone conversations with defendant's employee known to the defense, Plaintiff Hardy was again provided with the misleading information, namely that she would be provided high-quality, useful leads on prospective buyers by defendants and encouraged to enter into an oral agreement with the defendants for leads. Plaintiff Hardy was also told that she would be one of no more than two real estate agents who would receive leads per zip code purchase. Such statement was not true and was known by the defense to be a false statement, despite knowing about the entirety of the scheme and inclusion of fake leads and the leads that were promised by the defendants. As part of the agreement, defendants re, uh, reasserted the misleading information for the sole purpose of fraudulently inducing plaintiff Hardy to enter into the oral agreement and begin subscription services with defendants and Plaintiff Hardy did actually and reasonably rely on the misleading information by providing 
her credit card number to the defendants at the conclusion of the sales call to initiate a subscription for leads. Additionally, Plaintiff Hardy was aware of the affiliation between the defendant, NAR, and each of NAR's co-defendants herein when she entered into the oral agreement with defendants. As NAR has ardently presented himself as an advocate for real estate agents, including each plaintiff, Plaintiff Hardy trusted the defendants and believed the misleading information to be true, accurate, and beneficial. So she si- says she signed up on the basis of NAR. Now look, well, they'll find out. And then we go on. It says, after signing up each plaintiff, over the telephone, then defendants provided each plaintiff with an internet link to a dynamic web page, which was under the control of defendants and to which, which could and was unilaterally changed from time to time by defendants. The web page contained a series of terms and conditions that were not referenced in the sales calls between defendants, sales representatives, and each plaintiff, and only accessible if each plaintiff clicked on a link to access the terms and conditions. Thereafter, defendants would periodically change and modify the terms and conditions on its website in furtherance of the scheme. Plaintiffs allege that such unilateral efforts to modify oral agreements were not agreed upon by the plaintiffs and are not enforceable. So they're saying, look, we talked on the phone. You said this was going to happen. Okay. It did. It, it, then, then we went through a process where I, I signed up at this website. I've, I've already given you my information. I click this terms and conditions. I'm excited to use this, this, this program, and what ends up happening is these terms and conditions are changing over time, and I'm not being alerted to the, the, you know, the substance, substantive changes of these of this terms and conditions. And so now I'm, being, I'm agreeing to being part of terms and conditions that keep changing. Later, when the inevitable disputes arose, defendants would contend that the various versions of the terms and conditions p- were part of the agreement in effect when each plaintiff entered into the transaction, which was untrue. So what's happening is they say, look, I've got some bad leads here. You owe me money. And what the people are, what the defendants are saying, or they're saying, look, these terms and conditions are the ones you're, you're under. And the, and the plaintiffs say, look, I'm not under these. I was under the ones when I signed up. And they're like, no, no, no. That's the allegation. In doing so, Defendants did conceal the fraudulent nature of the statements made by the defendant's sales representatives to induce each such plaintiff to enter into an agreement with defendants. Hmm. As a result, each plaintiff was first fraudulently induced to enter into the oral agreement to pay monies to the defendants for the lead generation service based on the terms which were verbally shared with such plaintiff. Those terms included, so these are the saying, like when we were talking on the phone, these are the things you told me. Each plaintiff would receive 36 to 40 legitimate leads per month per zip code purchased, each such plaintiff would pay the agreed amount each month. The leads were valid. The leads were exclusive, shared with one other real estate agent or being provided on a very limited basis, and defendants would reimburse plaintiff for any invalid leads. Notwithstanding the foregoing, defendants shared the misleading information to not only induce such each plaintiff to enter into the foregoing agreement, but with specific knowledge and intent to change the terms of the agreement and assert that each such plaintiff had agreed to the applicable written documents, terms, and conditions later created by defendants, in some cases well after each plaintiff agreed to the purchase of fake leads. Ugh, bad. Defendants' conduct resulted in each such plaintiff paying monthly subscription fees to defendants, and each such plaintiff not receiving the benefit of the misleading information. Each such plaintiff complained about the fake leads and sought refunds or partial refunds from the defendants. However, the defendants then would engage in the attrition program, which included... Uh, showing for reciting, which included showing for reciting the fraudulent terms to each such plaintiff and asserting that each such plaintiff was not entitled to any such relief. In each situation, the defendants failed and refused to refund the monies paid by the applicable plaintiff or to offer any reasonable make good. Therefore, as a direct foreseeable legal factual and approximate result of the foregoing conduct by the defendants, each such plaintiff suffered and continues to suffer financial losses and other substantial and related losses in earnings, benefits, quality of life, goodwill, and has suffered con- and continues to suffer humiliata- humiliation, ridicule, contempt, embarrassment, severe mental and d- emotional distress, damage to plaintiff's reputation, discomfort, and other damages, the precise amount which will be proven at trial. You know, I can understand that. You call somebody and they're like, well, we didn't call about real estate services. And then like you call and you say, hey man, this this wasn't a true lead. And they're like, no, no, it's on you. You just can't close. You're a bad real estate agent. That'd be bad. Uh, then they talk about this this one, they, they go through the action. I, I don't know, I don't, I'm getting a little bit too long. But let's, let's go through this. It says defense 
breach the covenant of good faith and fair dealing in each of the oral agreement in each transaction conducted pursuant to such oral agreement in the following ways. Distributing and training defendant's sales team to distribute the misleading information in a manner designed to defraud each plaintiff. Engaging in the scheme during the entire lifetime of the relationship between the defendant and each plaintiff. Creating an unfair, inequitable, non-responsive, dishonest, laborious, com complicated, and frustrating dispute resolution process in furtherance of the scheme which was designed with the intent of placing the likelihood of attrition, wearing down plaintiffs and causing them to drop their complaints and claims over any intention to resolve disputes surrounding the fake lead. So they made it so hard that the agents would just give up. Attempting to unilaterally change, modify, and limit terms of the oral agreement by posting and linking terms, conditions, and other provisions which were not provided to the plaintiffs when the oral agreement was entered into and which were designed to undermine the terms of the oral agreement in a manner consistent with the scheme as such terms and conditions were unilaterally changed by the defendants at various times without plaintiff's knowledge. Defendants used a dynamic website to post such terms and conditions and made multiple unilateral changes which were only beneficial to the defendants without notice to the plaintiffs. And further, since this scheme, if plaintiffs complained about the fake leads, defendants would reference such change provisions in an effort to avoid ref refunding money to plaintiffs. So they're just literally, they were accused of changing the website's terms and conditions to benefit only them. And then if somebody signed up before the change in the terms of conditions, they would, <laughs> terms and conditions, they would refer to the newest uh, version. Uh, continuing, and we did that one, and then specifically training defendants' employees to further the scheme, further the attrition process, and regularly defraud, deceive, and manipulate each plaintiff to allow defendants to continue selling fake leads in every transaction, intentionally and wrongfully delaying not responding to and, and or denying legitimate claims and complaints by each plaintiff for refunds and proper accounting and connection with the fake leads. So it's not good. This is the fifth cause of action. Connection with each transaction between each plaintiff and defendants. Plaintiff pays money to defendants in exchange for defendants promise to deliver legitimate leads to plaintiff in the area and quantity provided for each of the oral agreements. In connection with such transactions, defendants were to exchange leads without any fake leads to each plaintiff. Similarly, defendants were to reimburse or properly credit each plaintiff for each and every fake lead received by each plaintiff. At the time of each transaction, defendants knew that the plaintiff would receive a large percentage of fake leads while paying for 0% fake leads. Nice. Defendants took each plaintiff's money under the guise of providing leads pursuant to the oral agreement, yet all the while defendants knew the defendants were proceeding unlawfully and in furtherance of the scheme by failing and refusing to refund or credit each plaintiff for the fake leads and the resulting shortages, defendants unlawfully converted plaintiff's plaintiffs into revenue. I mean, it goes on. I think that was the last one I did. But look, yeah, that's it. So I did, I did that Broke Agent Media had one. Um, it's a short little thing. I don't think I'm interested in doing any more. I think I'm going to go and, and just go to the screen. And I just want to talk about my, you know, my thoughts on it um, and my questions. And so here are the questions that I, and that's what's being alleged, okay? I'm, I'm just reading what the, what, the, what the case is. I don't know if they're guilty or not, I have no idea. I have, I have no idea. So here were some thoughts that I had. It says, how do you think this lawsuit will impact, impact the reputation of Realtor.com and the trust agents play, place in lead generation services? Well, as a public service announcement to every single real estate agent out there, paid real estate leads are terrible. They're awful. If, even, if, even if you do get a lead, okay, you got to pay the service that you got the lead from. You got to pay your broker. And by the end of the day, how much money do you have left for yourself to pay your own bills? It ain't worth it. I'm just saying. Like, look, I guess you can continue down this path. But, I mean, I learned long ago that paying for leads is a disaster. Uh, by watching others, by the way. I, I, I never bought leads. Uh, the property management leads were bought by someone else. And I wasn't even a salesperson in that organization. What measures should real estate platforms take to ensure the authenticity of the leads they sell to agents? Well, this is a very murky, murky situation. And uh, I say that because if you get like, say you have three websites and one has a name, one has a location and one has a contact, a bit of contact like an email address. If you can put those three together and actually have a lead, that's great. The problem is, is if you put them together and they're wrong, then it's like, I don't know how this is helping. That's a fake lead. Um, I think that the ones that, are, that say they're vetted, 
I think they need to call on their behalf and say, hey, are you a real person? Are you really looking for real estate services at a minimum? I think all sites should do that. Uh, that would, if you were working to be like a real, like legitimate company, that's what you would do. In your opinion, how can real estate agents protect themselves for similar fraudulent practices in the future? Don't buy leads. You could put, you, you know, you could put Zillow out of business tomorrow if you wanted to, but, but we don't. You could put Realtor.com out of business tomorrow, but we don't. Why? Because people are afraid to, to, to think that their business can be built without paying for leads. It's perhaps a little bit of greed. It's perhaps a bit of narrative. If you're a, a team, a real estate team, you're paying for leads that your people underneath you can close. And you can always tell them, like, look, you're just not closing these leads and I'm paying for them. What's wrong with you? It's very, it's mentally, uh, it's, it will just destroy you over time if you, if you feel like you're a peak performer. Do you believe NAR's alleged complicity in this case could lead to wider scrutiny of its practices and partnerships? Look, NAR is, is, is under fire. NAR has a target on their back and they've had a target on their back since I don't know how long, okay? Does this help or hurt? I don't think it does either. They're gonna continue to get sued. Um, we have, but through other lawsuits we can follow. Um, they've got a problem, and I don't know how they're going to get themselves out of it. Uh, if you purchased leads before, what was your experience, and did you feel they were worth the investment? Has anybody, anybody that watches this, have you purchased leads, and do you feel like you got your money's worth? I'd be interested to know. You don't have to put who it is with, but just tell me who it is. I'd, I'd be kind of interested. How important is transparency from lead generation companies in the real estate industry, and what should be the standard? Well, I think, like I said, they should be vetted and you should be able to easily disavow a fake lead and be credited or be given cash back. What do you think this lawsuit could mean for smaller real estate agents who rely heavily on purchase leads for their business? Look, this is a very, very difficult business. 80% of real estate agents who start within three years are no longer in the business. And, and companies that sell leads prey on the most desperate of people. Some people come into real estate without any sort of capital uh, to continue, like they're already broke when they start, they spend what little money they have on lead generation services, and pretty soon the business takes them out just because they can no longer make it. It's very, very cruel. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Uh, but that's what happens, and it's it's very frustrating. So uh, in closing, I don't know if NAR will be, uh, at the end of the day, part of this class action suit. They are being named in the complaint, um, and... I mean, I went through it. Uh, I don't know if the allegations are true or not. I know that lead generation services in the past have been shoddy uh, and not worth my time, and so I haven't been a part of them. But I'd be interested to know what you think. It's a long video, but we went through the case, and uh, thank you for watching. If you made it to the end, uh, please consider subscribing. If you haven't subscribed already, uh, I would appreciate it. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you, and good night.